Now, what you're about to hear is a prophetic message. And that's because not only does it contain information that was given to me directly by the Holy Spirit in order to be delivered to the listeners as an apostolic warning, but it also contains real-time prophecies pertaining to future events that were revealed to me during the time that I was constructing the message. See, when I'm, uh, when I'm putting the message together, the Holy Spirit is speaking to me all the time, just about. I mean, you know, and I reach a point where I've done everything he needs me to do for that day, and then I get back on it the next day, and he comes back and he speaks. So uh, that's why all my messages are prophetic and apostolic. Because I don't like how I told you this before, I don't have a book of sermons I go by. I sat in front of the computer and Carol will verify that and listen to the Holy Spirit. And it's like, what do you want me to praise? And then he confirms it with scripture. So with all that said, turn to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4. That's 1 Timothy chapter 4. And while you're turning there, I want to uh, revert back to the dream or night vision. They're one and the same in this case. But I want to revert back to uh, the dream that Pastor Paul Dietrich shared with us last week. And for those of you who missed it, uh, you might find somebody that uh, was on last week and get it from him. Now, as Paul explained, I was in the vision or the dream, and he heard me say, it's here meaning that the tribulation period had finally arrived and that I had recognized it as being such. However, in a subsequent dream that I myself had during the following night, it was brought to my attention. In other words, the Holy Spirit put it in my spirit that because I was in Paul's dream and said it's here, meaning the tribulation period had officially begun, I would still be alive on the earth at the time I said it, which means I'll personally witness it when it happens. In other words, in Paul's dream, I wasn't speaking from heaven as one who had previously passed on. I was declaring that it had arrived on the earth while I myself was still on the earth which means that it's going to take place during my lifetime. Which I might add is also your lifetime. You can see why it's an important message. Now, up to that point, because I didn't realize the full meaning of what the vision entailed, and I'm talking about Paul's vision, dream, up to that point, the Holy Spirit because I didn't entail everything or understand everything, the Holy Spirit had to bring to my attention the fact that it meant that I'm not going to die before the tribulation period starts. I mean, I had to get that ingrained in me. I, I missed that part, see, when he was given it. Or at least I'm not going to die during the first part of the tribulation or, or it, you know, the tribulation uh, where I declared that it had already just uh, started. Now, I might die during the second part of it, but that'll be okay because I know God's in control and that if I do die at any time during the tribulation period, and I'm referring to the middle or the end, it'll be God's mercy in sparing me from having to go through the worst part of it, which would be yet to come. Now, for a confirmation of what I just stated, because I asked the Lord for a confirmation before I'd officially announce in the natural that it had begun, the tribulation, the Holy Spirit gave me another vision, one that kept recurring both while sleeping and awake. That was my confirmation. I've had others since then, but I won't go into detail. But in this particular uh, night vision and dream and while I was awake vision, this is what I saw. 
I was standing in front of a giant curtain that was drawn shut, and behind it was the tribulation period. In other words, I was able to see through the curtain, which was red, and I believe that was a representation of the blood of Jesus, but I was able to see through the curtain and to know what it was that was behind it, even though it was closed. And what the Lord wanted me to know by giving me uh, this vision was that as long as the tribulation period remains behind the curtain, it could only be discerned by those who are spirit-led. And that not until the curtain is pulled back will those who are not spirit-led be able to see it. In other words, it won't be revealed to those who are not spirit-filled. And I'm referring to the infilling or the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It won't be revealed to them until God allows them to see it. And of course, this would include, uh, include many in the church today. So, some people are going to see it ahead of time. Those who are spirit-filled. And others won't see it till it's possibly even too late. That's the seriousness of this message. Now, the prophetic mental picture that the Lord gave me concerning this revelation of the tribu tribulation being behind the curtain and ready to be revealed to everyone when he pulls it back is the scene from The Wizard of Oz, where Dorothy and her companions see what's behind the curtain when they reach the land of Oz. And you know the story. Uh, it's uh, Dorothy, <laughs> uh, the lion, the tin man, the scarecrow, and they, they're going to the land of Oz. And uh, they have a little dog with them, Toto. And uh, he uh, runs up to the curtain and kind of sniffs around and pulls it open, and they see what's behind the curtain. Now, I kind of question that because it's the wizard of Oz. But see, God controls everything. And he speaks to us in uh, language and so forth that we would know and recognize. So he will speak to you according to movies you've watched in the past, whether they were good movies or bad movies. I'm not going to go into that. But he knows everything we do all our life, everything. Now, the medium by which God gave me this vision, and by that I'm referring to this particular scene from uh, the movie, The Wiz. The medium by which he gave me this vision was not for my benefit, because I was there and I actually saw the vision firsthand with my own eyes, spiritual eyes. But it was given to me in this specific form so that when I tell others about it, they'd be able to picture it in their mind what the true meaning of the vision is. And what it is, the true meaning, is that the curtain is about to be open. Did you get that? Now, to confirm what I just said as being an authentic pro prophecy from God, the Lord told me that if I'm to be alive on the earth at the time I declare what I said in Paul's dream, that the tribulation period is here, that it's more than just here. It's in fact already in progress. And I can say that because I'm already 74 years old. Therefore, it has to happen shortly. Otherwise, my personal lifespan will be over before I could declare it, which is contrary to the time frame God has allowed me to live in in order to declare it as portrayed in Paul's dream. In other words, it has to start immediately if it's not already started so that the prophecy of me still being alive to declare it as happening can come to pass. So you can see how deep it is, and especially for me, because it's talking about my lifespan and so forth. So reading in 1 Timothy 
chapter 4. We're all familiar with this passage of Scripture. Just start with verse 1. 1 Timothy 4, 1, it says, Now the Spirit, that would be the Holy Spirit, because it's capital S. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, the latter times will be the last days, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. What are we talking about there? Spirits like Leviathan, Kundalini, Jezebel, and others. It goes on to say, and doctrines of devils. Then it goes on in verse 2 to say, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. In other words, they'll be like many of the politicians we see today who are narcissists, who really don't care about anybody but themselves. In other words, they ain't going to care for their people, the flock, or the people that the Lord puts under them. Then look at verse 3. Forbidding in mar forbidding to marry. Now, many people today are living together, together, not as someone's spouse, you know, husband or wife, but as their partner. I saw uh, uh, some, uh, I saw a person uh, on the news, this uh, lady was killed, murdered. And of course they had someone they were interviewing on the news, because crime's everywhere now in these big, big cities especially. And they didn't introduce this person they were interviewing as their husband or wife or whatever, it was a woman. It was her partner. And it's become so commonplace now, forbidding to marry. Then it goes on to say, and commanding to abstain from meats. Now, my sister Sherry's out in California, and she may not even know this yet, but California, they're trying to pass a law to forbid all pork products. They're trying to make eating bacon or pork products illegal. I mean, they were, uh, uh, this uh, governor they have now, one time he tried to stop people from drinking, I think it was sodas or Cokes or whatever, and I don't know how that went, because I'm sure people are still drinking them. But that's what they're trying to put through, a law against pork. Now, the pork farmers aren't too happy about it. You know, I saw them interviewed on the news, and uh, they're talking about lawsuits against the people that are trying to uh, make it illegal to eat pork products. It says, commanding to abstain from meats, which God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Now, the truth he's referring to is outlined in the next two uh, verses, which we're going to read on. Look at verse 4. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the Word of God. What that means is that the Word of God we just read allows us to eat these particular types of food. Now, see, I have a pet peeve about this because even though I'm wearing a tallit, I'm not, as far as I know, a Jew. I mean, I don't know if I have any Jewish blood in me or not, but I don't know that. I wear it just because salvation is of the Jews. Let's just leave it at that. But we've had people come in as the Messianic movement, and they would condemn me because I would eat uh, shrimp, you know, um, crabs. These things that the Jews aren't allowed to eat even today. And they would kind of condemn me for it. And yet I come from a family that was in the fishing industry. That's all we had. If there wasn't clams and oysters and fish and all these things to eat, we would have starved. So you think God wanted us to starve? No. This answers that question. It says, for every creature of God, uh, every creature is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God. 
How plain can you be? And prayer. Now, and prayer means that all we have to do in order to sanctify the food is pray over it. That makes grace a little bit more important. Now, at the time that I was reading this scripture, we just read, I was reading it for the purpose of inserting it into the message. The Holy Spirit spoke to me very distinctly and said, this is where we're at. In other words, everything that's mentioned in that passage of scripture that we just read applies to us right now. Everything. Now, to be more precise, let me say it like this. The last day generation that Jesus spoke about in Matthew chapter 24 as being the generation that would see all these things come to pass is us. Now, for a confirmation of what I just said, let me share a story with you that because the first part of it has already come to pass, we should give credence to the second part of it. Back in 2019, I talked about a prophecy a friend of mine had shared with me where the Lord in 2016 had previously visited him. And what the Lord told him during the 2016 visitation was that 2020 and 2021 would be challenging years, which it has been due to uh, COVID-19 pandemic and so forth. And he got this in 2016. He told it to me uh, early in 2019. Then I asked him, my friend, what the Lord said would happen after 2020 and 2021. And I was asking specifically, I said, like in uh, the year 2022. And he said, war. And the way he said it, the hair kind of stood up on my, <laughs> on my arm. War. Now, just last week, our president said in a news conference that he couldn't guarantee that there won't be a, quote, shooting war with our enemies because of the cyber attacks the United States is presently experiencing. You know what he's saying? We're probably going to go to war. Now, my thought on this subject is that should such a war happen, it could very well be the war that we studied a week or two ago in Ezekiel's chapter 38 and 39 as the battle of Gog and Magog. That's how close we are, folks. Now, in closing, I just want to shed some light on what the Lord expects of me personally during the remainder of my life, which may also apply to some of you as well, plus what's expected of the last day church as a whole. From this point forward, I'll be living according to a new paradigm, a new paradigm that the Lord has given me, and what that paradigm is is that I'm to stay focused on the last day manifestations that are about to take place during the tribulation period, until which time the Lord returns. Again, that was a confirmation that it's going to happen in my lifetime. Until the Lord returns, which according to the contemporary visions he's been given me, will take place during my lifetime. Also, as part of this new paradigm, I'm commanded to keep warning the churches that it's time to get serious about teaching spiritual truth rather than focusing on building up their religious structures through natural and fleshly means, such as, and I've named them before, gymnasiums, basketball courts, pretentious plays, and various other worldly activities that make them look more like the world than the godly institutions that they're called to be. 
And that's what's going on in the church today, folks. In addition, a staunch warning to the religious leaders of these types of organizations is that it's time to start focusing on teaching the truth about the times in which we live in as opposed to teaching the lie of pre-trib rapture and other so-called feel-good doctrines that leave their congregation helpless against what is about to take place. They are going to be helpless if they do not understand how to get spirit-filled and how to be in contact with the throne room through the Holy Spirit. And most of them don't. This morning, um, you know, sometimes I surf the channels when I'm waking up, and uh, Carol ran across the a guest that Perry Stone had on. And I don't watch Perry Stone a lot. I mean, I prefer to watch other people. And doesn't mean he doesn't feed certain people. I mean, he is a teacher and a good teacher. But what he had on was a, 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 a guest speaker that was saying that the churches now are uh, a cult. I thought, Carol come and told me that. And I thought, wow. That's pretty right on the times that they're a cult and because of the things they're doing and so forth. And that their attachment really is with the church more than it is with God. See, these are the people that will, won't have a clue what to do when this all starts coming upon us, tribulation and so forth, because their connection with their church uh, and their church is going to fail or fall, and they won't have any connection because they were never taught how to be connected to God, to the throne room, personally. In fact, Carol mentioned something about, uh, he mentioned that whenever churches divide, these cult churches, I guess he's talking about, when they divide, they usually disappear. You don't hear from them anymore. Why is that? Because they were never connected to the throne. They were connected to the church. And if the church divides, they're no longer connected to the other part of the church. And most of the time they disappear. Now, in place of these false doctrines and fleshly theatrics that's being perpetrated within the confines of these types of churches, in place of them, they need to teach their congregants how to be both spirit-filled and spirit-led because their survival will depend on it. That is to say that those churches and church leaders that continue to offer emotional entertainment to their congregations in place of kingdom truths concerning the times in which we live in are causing their flock to be totally unprepared for what's about to happen. And the Lord says, it's already in motion, even as we speak. Now, in light of all this, my advice to the members of these soon-to-be apostate religious organizations and churches, as always, is to get out while you still can before it's too late. You can see the new paradigm. I'm not holding anything back anymore. I mean, if God says it, I'll put it out there. I go for confirmations first, of course. There's a lot of confirmations on this. In fact, some of the uh, the uh, preacher I don't even know that was a guest on uh, Perry Stone's uh, show, uh, he, he gave me a confirmation. So did... Uh, um, uh, Rabbi Snyder, that's just two, there's many. Now, for closing scripture, turn to the book of Amos, chapter 3, and I'll confirm what I've been talking about. Now, Amos is uh, in the, one of the minor prophets, in case you don't know where he's at. Let's see, Amos is between Joel and... Jonah, or Obadiah, between Joel and Obadiah. Amos, chapter 3. 
Now look at verse 6. When I, uh, the Holy Spirit spoke to me, I was looking for verse 7, because I've heard it before and I've preached it before. And I said, where is that verse? Where is that verse? And I, I heard the Holy Spirit say, Amos 6. Amos 3, 6, excuse me. So I, so I went there, I said, I guess I didn't hear him because from the verse I'm looking for is Amos 3, 7. But then the Holy Spirit, no, I want 6 and 7. The Holy Spirit knew that I would find 6 by wondering where 7 was. And he spoke it directly to me. So look at uh, Amos 3, verse 6. Shall a trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? The answer is no, because when the trumpet is blown, the people will be afraid. Shall there be evil in a city and the Lord has not done it? The answer to that is no, because God is the one that's going to be doing it. Then look at verse uh, 7. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret. It's a secret. Like behind the curtain, you can see how this scripture, the Holy Spirit wanted these scriptures in. This message. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto, and it's secret. It's not secrets. It's not plural, it's secret. See, he revealed to me one secret. And it was secret because it was still behind the curtain, which is about to be opened. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. He's not saying he's going to reveal it to the priests or the pastors or the evangelists, to the prophets. Now, in the Old Testament, Prophets were apostles, pretty much. They had the same function, pretty much. And in the New Testament, apostles were prophets. So essentially what this passage of Scripture is saying is that God is the one who will create the evil that will take place during the tribulation period, but he won't allow it to happen until he first warns everyone through his last day, apostles and prophets. Now, I'm not saying this because I am a prophet and an apostle. I didn't choose to be that. I've spoken about this before. God put it on me. And if I'd have known all that it required, I'd have said, no, Lord, you got the wrong guy. But he gave me a little at a time. And there was a time when I wouldn't use the word apostle, you could say prophet because, you know, there's prophets in some churches. The Lord gave me Ephesians 4.11, I believe it is. And it says, God gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And he said, if you were a pastor, wouldn't you call yourself a pastor? I thought, yeah. If you're an evangelist, wouldn't you call yourself an evangelist? Yeah. If you're a teacher, yeah. If you're a prophet, and I said, yeah, I already call myself a prophet. He says, well, I'm calling you an apostle. It's on the same line, the same sentence. It's in the same paragraph. And he told me from that point on to call myself an apostle because he made me one. And I give him all the glory. You can't make yourself to be an apostle. You can work toward it. And when God sees you're working toward it, he'll put you in that office. So... As an apostle and prophet, I'll be hearing these things, and other apostles and prophets will be hearing these things. So now you can understand why I tell people, I don't, you know, I'm not going to bash pastors. They're in there. They're in there once in the New Testament. Uh, I'm not going to bash evangelists because they get people saved into God's kingdom. I'm not going to bash teachers because somebody's got to teach. I don't even bash prophets, and I've known some that are false prophets. So I'm not going to bash any of them, and I haven't really in the past, but I have many times said I would rather sit under an apostle than any of those. Now you see why. Not because I am one, and I know what 
uh, happens or what God gives the apostles, you know, me personally. But I know that in the last days, that's who he's going to reveal his secrets to. That's what the, uh, the word said. He's not going to reveal it to pastors. Sorry. It's not in there. And he hasn't. He's not going to reveal it to teachers except what they would possibly learn from someone else. Say, a lot of these teachers put out these books about end time um, apocalyptic events and all that, but they're getting it out of the Bible and they're getting it from other people. They're not getting it directly from the Holy Spirit necessarily. Some might, because there could be that gift mix. They could be an ap apostolic teacher or an apostolic pastor. But that's not, that's not the case. That's not the way it is in most cases, I should say. So you can see all the times that I've been preaching, I encourage people to sit under an apostle. It don't have to be me. There's a few other apostles around. In fact, there's more now than uh, we thought because uh, Pastor Paul is doing, uh, and his wife Trish, they're doing uh, 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 music, praise and worship over at a church on uh, Friday nights, sometimes Wednesday nights if they have a special occasion for an apostle. And um, according to what he's teaching, it's recognizable that he is an apostle. In fact, uh, I think Paul told me the other day, he mentioned uh, this apostle that they're helping with praise and worship. He mentioned to his people that he would like to give them deeper things, but they can't take it. They can't handle it. They don't know enough of the basics where he could teach them the deeper things. That's the way I feel. That's a sign of an apostle. You know why we only got a few people on? We probably got a dozen. I can't, I'm going to take time, time to count them. Instead of, you know, hundreds or thousands, because they can't handle this. So the Lord has told me the reason our church is small and was meant to be small is because it consists only of the people that want the depth of the gospel and who can handle it. You could not bring someone who's a new Christian into this ministry and listen to what I'm talking about, and he's not going to understand half what I'm talking about. You couldn't even bring certain denominations to come in and hear this. I mean, Baptist, Presbyterian, we can go on and on and on, Church of Christ. They will not understand what the Holy Spirit has me teaching. It will be too deep for them. So they'll go back and sit in their comfort zone and learn the same things over and over and over for the next 5, 10, 20 years or however long they sit on the pews and have never been taught how to serve God. That's sad, folks. And at times I had to deal with it because I think, oh, why, why haven't we got more people? Why, why wouldn't more people want to hear this? Because they can't. It's a waste of time for them. And that's one of the reasons why we got few. But the few we have are those who are wanting the deep uh, messages of God. So close your Bibles. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, for as always your word is truth. It's absolute truth. Nothing but truth. It's the truth that guides us no matter what dispensation of time we may live in. We also thank you, Father God, for your precious Holy Spirit, who is our spiritual instructor, especially in these last days when the instruction that comes directly from your throne room is so desperately needed. For it's the means by which we will be able to survive the final days until our Lord returns. And in expe expectation of his immediate return, Father God, we boldly say, Lord Jesus, come quickly. And all in agreement said, Amen.